I went around and like shook everybody's hand and I said their name after I shook their hand. And I think I was just doing it out of nerves. And they were like, why are you just repeating our names after? And I was like, oh, it's just a tool to, that I use to like remember people's names. And then they're like, okay, what's my name? And I was like, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to New Heights, ladies and gentlemen. The Jukes Original Show presented by Wave Sports and Entertainment. New Heights is a show that shows off our trophies. Ooh, Ooh you like that Nickelodeon back there, don't you? And I then do. I got the, I got that big old Cleveland Heights. Cleveland sign. Heights. You That's the best know. trophy either one of us has. All right, now. Shout out to the one that gave it to me. We are your hosts. I'm Travis Kelsey. This is my big brother, Jason Kelsey, <laughs> out of Cleveland Heights, Ohio, ironically. And uh, University of Cincinnati grads, I can proudly say that. Uh, New Heights comes to you every single Wednesday. But today we're coming to you on a Monday. So the uh, the days might change now that we're out of season. But uh, if you subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, uh, at New Heights Show with one S on all social media platforms, we can uh, communicate with you guys on what exactly is coming up in the future. So make sure you click that follow button. And uh, Jason, what we got coming up? Well, we got a very special episode. This one, Trad, this one was recorded when I was at the Combine uh. on my own. Uh, while you were preparing for the uh, one of the highlights of your life, Saturday That's Night good. Live. All right, uh, we're going to talk about all things NFL Combine, scouting, how teams build draft boards. Uh, and now that it's wrapped, Travis and I uh, will describe what it's like for players to go through that. I know it's a little late, but we were a little busy, as we said, uh, the week of the Combine. So we're getting to that now. All right, now. I had an incredible conversation with NFL Network's own Daniel Jeremiah, also mm. former Eagle Scout. I don't know if you knew that, Travis. I did not know that. About all things scouting, drafting, and uh, what he thought of me as a prospect coming out, which <laughs> Ooh, I, I, can't I think wait it was a real it. opinion. It seemed like it was authentic, and I trust Daniel. Ooh, I trust ooh. DJ. What do, you, what do you think of me? What do you think of me? We'll get to it. Okay. You're not going to be happy. All right. Anyways, before we get to it, new news. New news. Coming in hot. We are back climbing the ranks and uh, happy to be back for the off season. Um, and... You know, we just want to say Try thank to you. Get to the now that the off season top. is here, now that the off season is here again, just thank you to all of our ninety-two percenters out there, everyone who yeah. supported this pod, <laughs> helped <laughs> to get <laughs> to where it's at today. Um, we're looking forward to giving you guys this pod this entire off season. We're gonna have some fun. We're gonna have some fun, ladies and gentlemen. Now that it is the off season, we're gonna double down. We're gonna try and bring you guys more episodes. We have more time to do this. Double more Jeopardy? interviews. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do everything we can to show you what it's like to be an NFL player in an off season. Oh, That's gonna include interviews and content, obviously surrounding the NFL, but it's also gonna include things that happen to some NFL players outside of the NFL. For instance, Travis Kelsey hosting Saturday Night Live. Um, what? That was crazy. Different things you might do out in the public. Hey, you leave yeah. your house, you meet people. Just got to leave <laughs> no. the house. Just got to get outside, baby. And then we, we're going to do some things where we, we, we take our game to new heights. We're going to kind of venture into some new worlds, hopefully, and show you guys uh, exactly what we're talking about eventually. But Calving season starts in April. <laughs> get your boots uh, now. Also, we know today is the day that tampering starts. This episode uh, was obviously pre-recorded, so we're not going to be able to give any insight uh, to the tampering period, but we will be offering that at a later date. Um, tampering period is also has always been a little weird. Um, what do you? It's, what's it's the tampering like period again? Tampering so those period. Those who don't is, know, you got to tell the ones that don't know. So tampering period is your agents are allowed to talk to teams and facilitate deals and make agreements. Just like free agency, but it's not official yet. So you can get the ball rolling. I don't know why that got passed. It really doesn't make any sense to me because all the contracts and things end up getting leaked before free agency officially starts on Wednesday. I think that's uh, why. It is. I think yeah. that's why. I think that's why is right that why? there. Yeah. I think so everybody... they just want to. They want a big Facebook they create official. Gossip. Yeah. They want. They, they want. <laughs> it doesn't become Facebook official till Wednesday. Until then, it's all just hearsay, but we can't wait to comment on all the free agency. It's going to be some big moves made. Obviously, the Eagles, we have a lot of free agents up, so it'll be interesting to see where guys start landing and getting picked um, and to see who's getting paid. And um, love to see teammates getting paid. One of my favorite things. Love to see teammates getting paid. We'll find out if Aaron Rodgers is going to be a Jet. I know Jets Jake, uh, are the, the guy who runs all of our social medias, uh, if you interact with anything New Heights, it's 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 my man Jets Jake. Um yeah, he's very curious to see if Aaron Rodgers ends up a Jet. 
Uh, we're also going to see if uh, someone pays Lamar Jackson. and uh, Pay that man. I guess we'll find out maybe if I'm playing or not by then. Uh, anyways. What? Who really knows, though? I do. I you know. know? Yeah, I know. What do you know? I know that you're going to make a decision soon because you love the Eagles and you want to make sure I that do. they know who's coming I I, back. What? I, I do want them to know. The problem is I have to know myself. Hey, uh, before we get to uh, the rest of this show, we need to shout out one of our sponsors, Fireball. Fireball takes any event to the next level, especially celebrating and winning the big game. Fireball's iconic tastes fire and goes down easy, making it the ultimate crowd pleaser. That's why it's the number one shot in the country. That's right. It's iconic cinnamon flavor taste is absolutely fire. And what I really like about the fireball shooters is that there's no shot glass needed. You just crack that thing open, knock it back. Jason, you look like you're throwing fireballs left and right. Are you a big fireball guy? Huge. It's the number one shot in the country, Trav. Don't know if you've heard. Mm. Just crack it and enjoy it. You can get fireball wherever you purchase your fine spirits. All right now. All right, moving on to new merch. We got some new, new merch. merch. Uh, we got a huge update from our friends over at Homage, and that uh, we just dropped some uh, brand new merch. The uh, t-shirts, No Dumb Questions, which is fire. I can't wait to get my hands on that one. And then uh, Stamp of the Week, <laughs> you already know what that entails, taking your game to new heights. So uh, we got those two shirts coming at you hot at uh, homage.com slash new heights. So if you want to grab those things, check out our friends at homage.com slash new heights, baby. Um, oh, now let's get on to our 12 bold topics hey of the NFL Combine. Recapping the NFL Combine. I'm so excited to see how many topics we actually touch today. But uh, let's start with a little broback about the NFL Combine. Love uh, it. We, we didn't get to touch base last week because uh, I was a little busy. A little busy doing a lot of things and uh, trying to be a whole bunch of different people all in hey. one sitting. It's crazy. Obviously, that being Saturday Night Live. Jason, you were the first to uh, to get drafted and go to the Combine. Mm-hmm. When did you know you were headed to the Combine? To those, those the people that don't, don't know yeah. how this happens, how do, you, how do you remember it happening? I can't remember if the team told me. I definitely don't didn't open a piece of mail because I didn't open mail in college. Is, I don't know if what anybody do you mean? else you did. Still use your, you still use your UC email. I did for a long time. It, it shut. I'd use it for long enough, and then it just shut down on me. Oh, because you weren't taking classes. I think after like ten years of graduating, they just shut your email off. I guess. That's I don't crazy. Know. Yeah. All right now. It stopped working. So uh, yeah, I got a new email, but I, yeah, I don't know if they email it to you. They mail it to you. I do know that at some point your agent says you're invited to the combine, and you immediately try and select a combine training facility. Well. You've probably already selected that in anticipation. And that's if you're fortunate enough to have the funds to be able to do that. You know what I mean? Because it, it's not free. You know what I mean? Like you're, well, it, you're typically your agents your are agent kind of. Your agent pays for it usually. Yeah. So the way it works a lot of times, at least for guys that agents think are going to sign with an NFL team, is they will pay the cost to these trading facilities for the player to, uh, knowing that they're going to get reimbursed when the player signs a contract. Guys that aren't invited to the combine still end up going to train at these facilities because there's still pro days. There's still um, – there's a lot of guys that get drafted that don't go to the combine. I don't know if it was Daniel Jeremiah or if it was Rich Eisen that said how, what percentage of players go to the combine that get drafted. Uh, but it's like 98% of the guys that go to the combine get drafted, which I did not know. That's It's, it's a very large number. Yeah. I mean, we were just talking about how the the entire – beginning process of the combine and that's essentially what it is if you're fortunate enough to have an agent that's willing to pay for you know what i mean your uh your training your combine training your pro day training uh you know that's a fortune i know a lot of guys just end up going right back to their college um and training at their college because it's typically free you can just work uh you're still got your scholarship a lot of guys you know what i mean still uh kind of living off of the the college life and it, you can go to your teams or your school's uh, weight room to be able to train and get ready for your pro day. Once you get to the, one of these facilities, um, and there's a bunch of them all over the country, you really start training more for a track meet than you are training for to be a football player. 100%. It's, it's much different. 
You know, the whole your whole life you're training to be the best you can. At, well, not your whole life for college at least. You're training to be the best you can as a football player. You really are. Um, everything is designed to make you, for me, the best offensive lineman, for Travis, uh, the best tight end. And uh, when you get to the combine, it's all about trying to get to the optimal weight, the optimal condition to test the best um, and most likely to run the best. Uh, you know, some guys worry about 225 tests depending on the position, but the majority of it comes down to how can we make our 40 time look the best? How can we make all of these different drills um, look the best? How can we make sure that we're on top of all the uh, receiver drills and the catching the ball? Like you're repping everything you're going to do at the combine at these places. Um, now, I, and I don't think they did this when I was coming out, but I think now they actually like test the wonder like before, like there's a whole like strategy to test higher on the wonder <laughs> yeah. test. Yeah. Which I don't, I don't know if you're getting any better at the wonder lick over if you're, the if course your scores, of like a month or two. <laughs> this is my hy- hypothesis. If you're scoring low enough that you need to <laughs> to study don't the test it. to get better, I feel like most of those guys aren't studying the test to get better. <laughs> like, I think that's fair to say, right? You only get knocked on the questions that you... Your point is how many questions you answer correctly. So if you don't answer a question, you technically don't get anything knocked. Well, it's not about knocking. You just Your score ends up being a number, and that's how many questions you answered correctly. So there's 50 questions. So the best you can get is 50. So if you're confused on a question, just fucking keep it Just skip moving. it. That's the, well, that's the advice that they the give quest, you. Try, you try to get to all the questions many, you know. The, the, the point of the test is to try and answer as many questions as you can. Right. That's one of the things that I I only answered half the test because I'm a slow reader. And this is another thing that I like have a problem with the Wonder Laker time test in general is if guys are slow readers, they're not going to have great Wonder Lake score tests. I almost feel like a Wonder Lake score. The questions are so easy. I almost feel like the guys that don't score well on those are just not good at reading. That's fair. Because the questions really aren't that hard on it. No, I'm, I'm with you, except for like some of them. I mean, there's there's one or two math ones that are a little bit wordy, but like for the most part, twenty of the questions. Train are, A is moving at. Yeah. <laughs> Time out. Okay, the train. Okay, if the train left Phoenix. Train A. Okay, Phoenix is on Pacific Standard Time. No, draw, uh, Phoenix draw, is on uh, Mountain. Draw, draw a train with an A on it. Train A is moving. This for a dry um, game up, and the test is over. Please pass it to the front. I was still. I was. I didn't even get to train B yet. <laughs> Just got done putting drawn in the windows on yeah. train A. There's a long window way of saying I think the Wonder Lick score in in terms of evaluating football intelligence is next to. Like, as far not important as possible, that's where I'd put the Wonder Lake test. Yeah, um, I'm with you. But it is kind of funny to see some of these scores. I mean, it back. is. It's amusing. It's when you um, see a bad, when you see a really, if you get a below a 10 on Wonder Lake, it's definitely, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know another way to say it. There's a bunch of preparation that goes into it. I mean, from nutrition to to everything, the, the fundamentals of the 40, the shuttle, the, you know, you're training for just about two months or, or, yeah, just about two months for your bench press. And you see guys just bulk up and just become absolute beasts going into this combine. And then you get to the combine and it is a mental drag for uh, for a lot of guys that, you know, haven't been in a situation like that. I, uh, I know it was a mental drag for me going from team to team, answering the same questions, getting asked the same stuff about my medical stuff, like injuries, uh, it's a drawn out process. Yeah. Um, they throw you in a pair of spandex and take every, uh, take a picture of you in every angle of your body, They're measuring every inch, every inch, <laughs> <laughs> like a slab of meat, like a uh, slab of sausage. Every single go. inch. There you go. And, uh, yeah, it's a pretty interesting and weird process. But um, when it comes down to where you can actually uh, make some progress, I think, is in the team interviews. And when teams are teams are asking you to, you know, put on a board your favorite play and uh, and 
does it change versus coverage? Can you read coverages? What are you looking at on certain plays that they might have some of your film? They might throw it up on the TV and ask you what your thoughts are or how you're being coached on certain things. So you, it just it helps them understand how good you are at communicating what you're being taught, which also means how much confidence you have in what you're doing out there on the field in terms of fundamentals. How far down the road are you in terms of understanding scheme? Yeah, and I think that goes way further than any Wonderlick score ever. For sure. That is, if I can talk about the different coverages I was seeing and you know how I altered my route or how I went through my progression or how I picked up this blitz and I knew this blitz was coming because of the scheme and because of what you saw on, on the film the, the week before or what yeah. your coaches had been telling you. know, all that communication, if you show that you're, you have a business-like approach – to the game at the college level, that's automatically a, a check in the box of just you know him being ready for uh, for the NFL because that's yep. what they really want to see. They want to see guys that can come in and start right now with that business like mentality. Yep, I think I think there's three major components that are going to improve your draft stock the most. One, obviously, is your film. How you played your senior year is the biggest determining factor. Two is medical. If you're not going to clear medical, you got injuries that they're worried about, or you're going to if you if they're worried about injury, all of a sudden you pass those injuries, uh, or medical doctors pass you, uh, it'll improve your stock. Uh, the third way is these team interviews. I mean, it, this is a team game. This is a relationships game. This is you're you're interacting with players and coaches, and and they want to see guys that they want to be around, right? Um, you still got to play. Don't get me wrong, but. That can definitely be a deciding factor in how much a team likes you, how much where that chemistry uh, fits in at. Um, if you remind them of certain people, all of these things factor in in these team interviews. Do you have any not- notable interviews? I only had, I think I had three I had formal interviews. So I, I'll say this too: at the combine, there are informal interviews and formal interviews. Informal, you're in a big room. Every team has that position that you're at. You're at like a lunch table, and everybody just it's a free for all and they're just running and grabbing you and they're trying to get you to basically fill out a very generic sheet that they're having everybody at the combine fill out formal interview is usually your position coach that's with that team gm um head coach usually scouts or oc D, D, offensive coordinator defensive coordinator yeah. yeah head scout yeah usually it's the higher ups in the organization that are that are watching uh that are in that room not always i did a patriots formal and I believe in Indy and um, Bill was not in the room. I did a Chiefs formal interview, I think. I nice. Romeo Cornell? Oh, my gosh. I think it was the Chiefs. Yeah. That's crazy. I remember. It wasn't Romeo Cornell. It was uh, Todd Haley was the head coach. Mm. Well, Romeo might have been on defense, though. Which one jumped out at you and why? All I remember was in the first interview – and I had heard through the grapevine that they liked me a lot. That's why I think it was the Chiefs. I went around and like shook everybody's hand, and I said their name after I shook their hand. And like, and I think I was just doing it out of nerves. And they were like, uh, "Why are you saying our names after your? Why are you just repeating our names after?" And I was like, "Oh, it's just." <laughs> I was like, "It's just a tool to, that I use to like remember people's names." And then they're like, "Okay, what's my name?" And I was like, "You got me." <laughs> <laughs> So did not go well. was not a good starting point. Then they proceeded to ask me about some anger issues I had in college, apparently. And um, it went south real quick. Oh, man. Great times. Yeah. I think, what about uh, you? I had like... I, I, you uh, have one from the Ravens. That's one of my favorites. You got to share the that. Ra- the, ra- the Ravens you share, wasn't, share that wasn't at the Combine. That wasn't that at wasn't? the Combine, though. That no, was that at was your uh, top 30? Of, yeah, top 30. At the Combine, I had some, I had some bad interviews. Uh, we already talked about the Patriots one where I was trying to get Belichick to crack a smile and yeah. just didn't didn't and couldn't. And after I tried, just felt like it was an uphill battle from that point <laughs> on. <laughs> Here we go. Um, but uh, a lot of these interviews, it's, it's kind of interesting to see what teams, what approach some teams go. Because some teams are going to throw up a play that – What's your favorite play? Some teams are going to p- throw up a play that you might have did really bad on, um, and they want you to kind of coach yourself on this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some teams will throw up a play that's not even your film, 
and they're just going to talk about football and ask you what your knowledge is on this kind of concept or this kind of route. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? It's a, it's cool to see what teams do 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 what exactly. Um, I know the Cowboys and uh, shout out to Coach Garrett, Cleveland, Ohio, baby. Uh, representing Northeast Ohio up in the uh, in the football world, um, yep. the Cowboys were kind of they were they were kind of pressing me about you know what I mean me having this red flag of missing uh, missing a year being and suspended for a smoking season smoking weed yeah back in yeah. Uh, and I had uh, I had just I don't know if I was having a bad morning or what was going on but I um, I basically was just I don't even know if I want to say this. It uh it ended really fast. That meeting ended really fast, and uh, they're Tom, typically fifteen. They're typically fifteen minutes long, and what'd I was say? in there for about five minutes. I basically just said, if you guys think um, you know, I'm gonna be that kind of guy, or you're questioning, you know, if I'm still that person after everything that I've kind of battled through to get to where I am now from from missing a season um then you guys probably go somewhere else and pick somebody else and uh that is exactly and, what they, and did. they did that <laughs> yeah they took your advice and drafted gavin escobar gavin escobar who i yeah. thought was a stud they were trying to find the um the predecessor for uh jason witten jason witten yeah and um i i botched that interview and um, yep. yeah, well, they had lost lost a few lost a few dollars. Not to say that they didn't think Gavin was a better player going into that interview. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Who yeah. knows what it really was? But sure. I know I didn't help myself with that didn't one. Help you? You don't think and that then, helped? Uh, no, that did not help. Uh, all the other meetings, I stayed a full fifteen minutes, and uh, <laughs> maybe they <laughs> left. And they were like, "Wow, this guy really has changed his ways. He's very confident now." <laughs> Still not as good as Gavin Escobar. All right. And uh, I feel like he was going to attack me. I had like 10 interviews. I, the Steelers was another one where it was it was a really unique interview. They had every, for what felt like everybody in the building in that room. And these are you guys got to understand. These are hotel rooms. This is at a this entire like gig is at like a convention center slash train station, old train yeah. station that they turned into a hotel room. And they're keeping the train there. Yeah, and the train is like the hotel room. It's crazy. Yeah. So you go into this hotel room, very minimal light, kind of dark, and you know either they have a TV in there or they're just interviewing you straight up. And yeah. uh, and I go into the Steelers and I say what's up to Mike Tomlin. We talk about you know Cincinnati Bearcats and when he coached at Cincinnati. That's right. Um, so I'm thinking this interview is going great and everything's you know I'm killing it. Um, at the time, they got Heath Miller, and he's kind of getting a little older. And I'm like, wow, man, mm -hmm. they might be looking to see if they can get a tight end. Yeah. And uh, and I, tr of course, me being the f I can't be fucking serious ever. I sit there, and you know those little like side lamps that are at the hotel. Like those are the only lamps, like the the bed light lamps. You know what I mean? That are just it's just like this little like lamp yeah, that's got the little head on it. It's yeah. yellow yellow light. It's not like a real like aggressive light. Okay. And I'm looking at it, it's like, I know that face. And it's just staring at me, and it's like a mean-ass face, man. That dude looks like he's pissed back there. He's not having any of this shit. And it just clicks to me. It's like, is that, Joe, is that mean Joe Green back there? Is that mean Joe Green? Mean Joe and Green was in there. Mean Joe Green. So I'm you know what mean Joe Green looks like? Of course. What? That's awesome. Everyone should. He's in one of the most iconic Coca-Cola commercials ever. I asked in the middle of me answering a question. I was like, does that mean Joe Green? Because that's kind of intimidating that he's sitting right under the light like that. And everybody kind of looked back and I was, no, just crickets again. Just no laughs. And, you didn't uh, learn from the New England <laughs> interview? That's one of the things they're processing. How quick of a learner is he? Well, he's still cracking jokes. <laughs> That are bombing. <laughs> you know, he either needs to get funnier or he needs to just shut the fuck up. So, yeah, there was that. Didn't get drafted by either one of those two teams. I feel like I had like 10 to 12 interviews, and it's like, I don't necessarily know if you want interviews, formal interviews. You know what I mean? Because that means there's some questions that yeah. they need answered. So, I, I think you want them. You want them? You want as many want meetings as you need? All right. As I'm a six round pick who only had two or three formal interviews. I think the more the guys who are getting a lot of the formal interviews got drafted a lot higher than I did. Nice. And honestly, when I got, I got in the room with the chiefs, I had a, I had a formal interview with the chiefs. You did. What they I asked did. you? They asked me football. They asked me, uh, 
Tom Melvin, our tight ends coach, that yep. was in, in Philly, you know him real well. Yes. Tom was grilling me on some, you know, planting break steps on my routes. Nice. And I uh, I told him, you know what I mean, at the end of the day, I just got to catch the ball. You know, screw the, the fundamentals, you know, I got to catch the ball. <laughs> and, uh, and Tom was like, hold what on. <laughs> Hold on, not <laughs> screw the fundamental because I mean it hit my hands. So I was essentially saying like no matter what the fundamentals look like, the ball hit my hands. I got to catch the I fucking ball. Just, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> screw the fundamental. I mean, outside, outside, yeah, the fundamentals are trash, Tom. They were That's they were funny. atrocious. I get it. I got. I need to plan. I have a better plan, better break. But at the end of the yeah. day, the ball was in my hands and I dropped it. And I dropped it. Yeah. Yeah. So. I just uh, love that you said screw the fundamental. I don't know if I actually said screw oh, the fundamental. Okay, okay, I'm saying okay. like in my head, I was just like, yeah, Listen, well. I understand there's coaching points, but at the end of the day, <laughs> fuck the coaching points. I just got to catch this ball. <laughs> that ball's in the air. It needs to get fucking caught. All right. However, we got to make oh, that gosh. happen. We got to make that happen. But it didn't even feel like, like, honestly, honestly, it didn't even feel like they were really like interviewing me it felt like everybody knew you so well that yeah. it was just like all right let's just let's interview the family member and just you know what i mean it was almost like i was just in a room chopping it up with like my extended family about football you know what i mean like it, it didn't even feel like it was like a real interview and uh so i left that room like the chiefs don't want me they were just doing that just because i was you know what i mean one of their favorite guys little brother you know yeah they just wanted to kind of have it on the board Make yeah, it look like out of respect for for Jason. We're gonna exactly. Yeah. Little did I know they were uh, they were looking at a tight end. So th- th- that's the interview portion of the combine. Uh, hopefully, uh, <laughs> you do better than Travis and I did. It sounds like <laughs> um, the uh, the other portion that's the biggest portion. Actually, the whole reason the combine even started uh, is just medical. This is a chance for them all to get your entire medical history. And the way it works, I mean, this is a whole day. A whole day is nothing. But medicals, oh if, you, if you need MRIs, you're getting MRIs. If you need x-rays, you're getting x-rays. Teams are grouped together, I think in groups of four, if that makes sense. And you fill out paperwork and you go into the room. And I don't know why it's not all at the same time. Uh, but each of those teams that's in that room get a chance to move your hips around, ask you questions, be a little bit more um, personal about your medical history. Then you get that one checked off and you and you get in line for the next room and you do that until you're done with all 32 teams. And um, and actually, if you're not cleared at that one, which I, I wasn't, you weren't cleared either, probably. Right. I was not. I wasn't. So I wasn't we both had to, to go anything. back. I think it's two months after that. There's another. What's that called? The uh, the medical day where you have to go back to Indianapolis to it's like a medical recheck. I was, Do you I, was doing that? I was cleared. I okay, was cleared. So you were cleared. I, I had was ankle cleared surgery. because I was, po- I was post-surgery. So I was already out was, of surgery and everything. I just yeah. wasn't ready to do any of the combine stuff. I got cleared by everyone, though. I had ankle surgery. And then I also had, I know we've said this before, but I had appendicitis at the combine. So I had appendectomy. So I had to go back for multiple things to get cleared. Damn. Uh, yeah. Not good. So the, you go through the, the team interviews. The medical day is a fucking drag. But that's honestly... One of the days I remember the most because you're just sitting in line yeah. with your peers, yeah. with guys that are going through the exact same scenario as you. I remember Lane sitting there, Lane Johnson, Kyle Long, those 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 sitting in a line with those two dudes. <laughs> I remember we I remember we drafted Lane Johnson, and he said, "I met your brother at the combine. He reminded me of James Dean," and I was saying, <laughs> "What?" <laughs> He was like, he was cool as a cucumber. He was, he was like, he thought you were the coolest thing he's ever done. That's my met. motherfucking dog right there, man. <laughs> I, said, I, I thought the same thing, Lane. <laughs> well, God, man, those are, but those are like the, those are the moments and the memories and the stories you hear around the, around college football that, you know what I mean? You remember forever, yeah. man, which are, uh, which is kind of the cool aspect of everybody doing it in one building, one at, at the same time as you get to kind of, you know, Say what's up to everybody uh, that you've been watching your entire uh, college career. The other portion is obviously the on-field drills and the testing. I did the testing at the combine. Trav, you did it at your pro day, right? Yeah, I did uh, select few at my pro day. I made sure not to give them too much, if yeah. that makes any sense. Fair enough. I actually really enjoy watching the testing. I have so much fun watching it. I'm glad the yeah. NFL shows it because it's 
it gives you kind of an insight and just kind of gets you to get lay your eyes on some guys without a uniform on and a helmet on. And you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I don't take that much away from it. Like, I do think I think I can tell when a guy's running or moving or bending. There's certain guys that I actually will take away from the combat and be like, well, I like the way that guy moves. I like the way he changes direction. Look at you, Scout Kelsey. I see you, dog. I don't like when guys look robotic. When a guy looks like he's fighting the ground, I don't give. A, I don't care how fast his forty is. I'm not going to be a fan. It's just the reality of it. I want smooth. I want silky smooth movers. That's all I care about. D- you didn't like DK Metcalf coming out. I didn't like me. Honestly, I would not have liked DK Metcalf's running style. And I I run very similar to DK Metcalf, just at like a third of the speed, um, <laughs> and similar body type, of course. But I saw uh, I saw DK Metcalf run, and I was like, oh my fucking gosh, that man yeah. is enormous running that yes. fast. That is it, he, it. that is like the, the 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 silver dude in the Terminator. The yeah. fucking you know what I mean? Like that run, that aggressive, just yeah. <laughs> Like yeah. he like he never gets tired. He just oh keeps getting faster and faster. It's like a piston. <laughs> this guy's like a machine. It's like Jesus. It's like uh, watching Adrian Peterson run back in the day. Just like he's like, oh my god, dude, fucking what? How are your ankles and knees holding on? You're, you're <laughs> you so are, aggressive. You are so- Can you just be like just run? <laughs> stop you, fighting everything. You don't have to put that much force in the ground, do you? Like I remember watching Lane Johnson move at his combine, dude. Not smooth, watching any of the silky, like, and smooth. there were a lot of there were there were a lot of really really good tackles that year, and athletic guys, Tron Armstead, end up running the fastest forty. But there was something about the way Lane moved. That Eric I Fisher, was, big fish, Eric Fisher, number uh, one Luke overall, Jokel baby. Was, was it? Yeah, he was number one, and then Luke Jokel went two, and Big Lane was four. And I do think the different drills transition to different positions. The drills I really like for offensive linemen are agility drills and I like the broad jump although I looked up Mitchell Schwartz's broad jump and it made me feel less important about the broad jump yeah that's bad well everybody's everybody has their you know what I mean strengths he makes up for a lot of the broad jump in terms of how big he is and his his fundamentals I mean between him and Lane they were the two best block, pass block and right tackles for a long time the reason I like the, the broad jump is because in order to have a good broad jump you have to be able to have good hip mobility because it's part of it is exploding out. But then the other part is being able to like to get the most distance. You have to like put your feet out and be able to catch yourself in a very fo- like a, a very uh, flexible position, athletic position. You know what I mean? Yeah. Listen, you know, I'm all about them hips. Listen, you and got then, good hip flexibility. I'm that's what I'm, I'm all putting about you too. a notch over the guys that, that got stiff hips. And it's just. Depending on, you know what I mean? Obviously, every situation is different. You know what I mean? Every situation is different, but typically smooth and, and hips, mobile hips. When I see guys like offensive linemen that play with really wide bases, that's bad. You don't want to play with a wide base. But I like that you can get to that wide base. If you can't get there, if you can't move your hips um, and with good flexibility, functional mobility, I just I think it's going to be really, really hard to change direction and function at the level you're going to have to in the NFL. And I think that's the same thing for receivers. Like, listen, I don't want you to be breaking all the time in this extreme position, but I like if you can do it. You know what I mean? I like if I like if your knees don't like I don't like when a guy looks like he's a track runner at the combine. I like I like when a dude looks like he's a basketball player at the combine. I want hips, knees, I don't care that it's inefficient. I want it to be unpredictable. That's what I want. I'm more technical when it comes to like the route running and stuff. I hate a lot how a lot of receivers run routes nowadays where instead of putting purposeful force into the ground, it's kind of like they just like spin in place really fast. They don't bend very well and a lot of it is just quick feet. You know what I mean? And you big drum roll guy? The- you big drum roll guy? I hate that high school hairy shit. So it's man. terrible. It's terrible. But at the same time, the come back. if you if you don't know how to run a route, that helps you understand that you need to work your arms with your legs going in and out of a break. And I'm and I'm all for that. Um, yeah. I think it needs to be in sync though. You can't just be up here and your feet aren't running as fast as you know what I mean. I'll give you a prime example of this. We were doing an off season conditioning drill where you got to go five yards, grab a tennis ball, come back, ten yards grab the ball, come back, 15 yards, grab the ball, come back. The receiver's doing it, and he's like 
drum rolling at five yards to grab the ball. And Lane is just running, putting his foot Grabbing. down, coming back. And he beat him. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like full movement. There's no point in doing the drum roll if it's slowing you down. The only reason you would do that is if it was going to help you get out of your break or make it uh, more unpredictable to the DB where you were going to break, right? Like, there's no sense in doing that otherwise. The only that time, the only time I'm really drum rolling is if I'm trying to fuck with the don't guy say, in front don't of say, me. Yeah, that's yeah. what I feel like. <laughs> I'm, I flanking. Feel like I'm flanking. I'm flanking. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna put the cheese right on the plate for you. If I'm gonna run sluggo, I'm doing a big drum roll. <laughs> 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 my, dude, my dude, Al Harris, Coach Al Harris, and the ex uh, NFL great Al Harris, cornerback. He uh, he was in Kansas City for forever, and I and I did that, or I I like overly like showed uh, a certain move a, on a double move. Right, the first move mm-hmm. was just super like, oh, I'm gonna run a hitch. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. A hitch and go. And uh, he looked at me and said, if it's too good to be true, do not do it. He will fuck with you every time. Yes. Like he's like yelling at the DB, like if it's too good to be true, do not bite. He yeah. is setting your shit up every single time with that. Well, I'm just like, oh, I gotta stop doing that. I was on yeah. my ass. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was so funny, um, but yeah, Al Harris had me, had me uh, schemed up. Back to the drills. I'm looking for hip mobility. I'm looking for ability to bend. I'm looking for um, a player that's running athletically, not mechanically. And I'm looking for a guy that can get to full extension and flexion. That's what another reason I like the broad jump. I like slowing it down. If you're not Just jumping, to see if you can get the if, full. If you're not jumping and getting fully extended out and coming back, to me that tells me that you're not. You're either athlete. you're not explosive or you're not a fluid athlete. Yeah. Like you should be able to do this movement. And yeah. I want athletes. It's I just, want I feel athletes. Like, I feel like you're going to miss the end of the day, less. I just want guys that can play the game too, you're right. man. This is all, you're right. And there's I a think, lot that goes into this. Yeah. I think when you're in the later rounds where you're wor- more worried about missing on a guy or you're not quite sure about the film being the best, I'm going to pick nine times out of 10. If I'm a GM, the guy who's more athletic and not the guy who necessarily times the best. I'm talking about the guy who I think is a better all-around athlete because I just feel like those guys usually figure it out. They might not be pro bowlers. They might not be like all pros. But if it's an athletic guy, he's going to be able to figure out special teams. He's going to be able to go in in situations, and I know he's going to be reliable. I know what I have in them. Um, they're less injury-prone. Uh, so those are all the things that I like watching at the Combine. There's nothing more where I'm like, dude, this dude is stiff. Or look, at this guy's running, and it's like all hamstrings. Like, he's not – it doesn't look right. Like, right away, unless it's like DK Metcalf. Then you're like, oh, let's get that guy. <laughs> Dude, you can't look at DK Metcalf and not be like, yeah, dude, I, I like that. I liked, I liked what I just saw. Should we retake the Wonderlick? Nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I'm in. You I just want to see it. Yeah, I'm in. So I would you love always, to see where I'm at. I think you're going to do better than me. You're better at reading. You, you, what? I'm just going to say this. <laughs> you. <laughs> I am always been a very slow reader. You actually read, though. You read all the Harry Potter books. You were. I did. You were a I had to do reader. sixth grade uh, reading, summer reading uh, project. I picked up uh, Harry Potter and the, Sor- and the Sorcerer's Stone. I read that for sixth grade and I was hooked. I read every book after that. Although, have you ever have you ever read a book and realized that you are not pronouncing any of the names correctly until the movie comes out? Like my entire no, life, I've never I've never done that. I no, read but I, all, I, <laughs> I read all the Harry Potter books before there was a movie, which was like four. I think Harry four Potter, books. Harry Potter, man. I had Harry I Potter. Harry right. Potter. <laughs> the names I had wrong. I had always thought it was Hagard. I don't know how why I thought it was Haggard, but it's Hagrid. Outle- Outliers. Hermione. I don't even remember what I thought Hermione was. I, th- I think it was Hermone. I just gave up on that one. I was like, I don't know how to pronounce this name. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, back to Anyways, us. Yeah, not back being to able the to combine. Read. Sorry. Sorry about that. So yeah, well, let's retake the wonder look. Important drills. Important drills. Important drills. I don't think there is really one specific drill that you can give a certain position that's like, all right, that's the one that you know what i mean you got to see there's so much you can you need to be able to do on the football field i like that they put some weight on the uh on the sleds so you can f- actually see who's like because we don't do that 
in Kansas City. We just we just hit the sled. Like if we're hitting the sled, we're hitting the sled, and we're working on fundamental. We're not trying to see you know how much power we can put into the sweat. But I think that's a good good uh, gauge on who's who's putting power into the sled to making and making you know what I mean making that yeah. thing jump, driving that force. Yeah. I, I agree. Think that I was hate a great hitting one. sleds, though. I'm, I'm, it's like one of my least favorite things because I feel like it's an unnatural grab, like yeah, target. Yeah. You know what I mean? It feels no, weird. I agree. But I agree, it is a very good gauge for applying force into the bag, and it's a good thing to see a tight end do. Yeah, and then um, I like or to see line. the gauntlet. I like to see the gauntlet. I like Which to see that? that's when you got like seven quarterbacks throwing you a football. You're running from like sideline to sideline. When you're running on the on the line, on the you line, gotta you stay catch on one the from line. This side, then this side, because what it does is it it makes you mentally keep it moving. You have to find the next football, find the next. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've seen guys get hit in the face. I've seen guys <laughs> trip over it's the not good. ball, dude. Put you in a hot hot seat real quick. Some guys don't know which way to turn. I forget who got hit in the face, man. Somebody got hit in the face off the rip. Um, either way, I like to see those two drills to see how fluent guys are catching the football and how much, you know, what their yeah. base looks like uh, when they're pushing the sled, things like that. The other two drills that I really like are the agility drills, the three cone and the 20 yard shuttle. And it's not so much for time. I remember what the coaching points were for me when I was running that. So I like to see the strategies or lack thereof of guys. Like I don't think a lot of people realize like to, to have a good 20 yard shuttle time, it's less about running it as fast as you can and more about hitting the steps, steps. and it's breaking points. Like purposeful it, it, movement. Yeah. Like if you go four steps and, Ooh, and touch that oh. line and come back, coach us up. You're going to be faster doing that drill than if you have to take six because you're not being coordinated with your movements. Even if, that, if it's faster, you might get to the line quicker doing six, but you're not going to come out of the line as fast. You're not going to break out as quickly. I remember I would run that 20 yard shuttle, and I was, if I ran as hard as I could, I'd be somewhere in the four fours, maybe high four threes. But when I hit every step, I was always low four twos, sneaking into the four ones. Like you run four steps. You don't run. You stay lateral because you don't want to have to turn your hips again. Mm. Like the the two turns are the biggest time savers on that drill. 100%. So like if you can maintain your hips square, hit that line seven steps uh. this way on your seventh step, plant left foot down, out. Dude, there's no way you remember all this. I swear this to is God. Hilarious, Not only that, I remember on and your I sixth I don't step. Know if, I don't know if anybody's getting anything out of this. Well, I just remember on your sixth step, so you 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 stay square, shuffling basically, but an aggressive shuffle. <laughs> you're, when you plant with your right foot, you want your right foot to be in front of your left, so that when you come out, you don't have to come back out across your hips. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know then, what you mean. When you get down there, you one, two, three, four, five, six step. You want to be turning it already. Yeah. So that That's you're ready a, you to cheat clear the turn. your hips. You cheat the turn to cheat your hips, and then all you got to do is bring your torso around with your elbows. And then, pos yep, and positive shin angle, you're going to come out of there good. Ladies and gentlemen, purposeful movement by Jason Kelsey. If you yep. if you do this thing with the steps, it's all about fundamentals. See, that's what yep. Tom Melvin was trying to tell me. And I screwed up the three cone drill because I tried to do it in less steps, but I wasn't good enough to do it in less steps. I tried to do it the way receivers do it, but I'm too fat and I had a big gut. So I jumped. I literally jumped in my three cone. It would have been better if I would have just started in a right footed stance. That was when you had an appendix. And then now, now that that's out. It is. That's true. Now that that's out, I could probably do it in three steps. So what was it like uh, going back uh, now, 12 year veteran in the NFL, best center to ever play the game, going back to the combine? How much of it do you think is just a joke or what did you get a take away from it? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> So now that you're a veteran, I do think that the combine is a little bit like not overhyped, but you know, there's, you realize that at the end of the day, it all comes down to your film and what you do out on the field. And, you know, you want to, as long as you get an opportunity to prove that, that's what you want. Um, and you realize how much other teams kind of, it's not the only thing going on at the combine. As a player participating in it, you think it's all about the guys that are out there running the drills, yeah. being evaluated. Slabs of meat. When you, when you go back there, you find out, oh, 
these guys are just hanging out and bullshitting all day. Like it's, it's basically just a big networking convention where, I mean, how many deals get done in that little bar at the bottom of the Marriott? I'd be yeah. really curious to know. Um, or at least where the spark starts. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of guys there. I just found this out this past weekend that don't work for a team. Like a lot of them are just there looking to get hired. Like there's a lot of guys that are looking for work that go to the combine because they know all the coaches and people are going to be there. So they're going to go show their face and hope when a job opens up that they're going to get a job. So yeah, much different experience, not uh, being a participant. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I got to see a lot of people and a lot of coaches and um, a lot of guys that I played with that are now coaches, not to mention all the wonderful people we, that I got to interview, including the guy that we're about to introduce right now. So you've heard non-combine experts give their thoughts on the combine. I'm an expert now. Let's go to the conversation with our draft and combine expert, Daniel Jeremiah from the NFL Network. This conversation is brought to you by our friends at Accelerator Energy. Drink. A shock, baby. Fueled by nature. Also known as A shock. <laughs> Fueled by nature. All right, our next guest was a quarterback at Appalachian State University, a former uh, Eagles uh, West Coast scout um, when I first was in Philadelphia. Um, now the uh, analyst for the NFL Network. You can catch him during all the NFL Draft Combine coverage this week. Uh, my guest right now is Daniel Jeremiah. How's it going? Good. What's Good up, man? It's, it's great to see you. It yeah, it's been, been a minute. Yeah. I guess we'll start it right off. Let's get all the dumb combine questions out of the way. <laughs> uh, does the combine matter? What is... Yeah, what do you take away from the combine? I think it does. I think you got to kind of know what it is and take it for what it is. I think there's people that say, like, this is the dumbest thing ever. It has no value. I, you know, I don't believe that. Not that. And I think there's other people that put too much into it. But, you know, I always looked at the teams I was on. A lot of times we had clumps of players where you had maybe it's three, like, corners that you kind of have together in that third round. You have the same grade on them. You know, and you, now you get to see them in the line out there working out on the same field. Maybe that little bit separates one or two of those guys. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I, I think the value is, just to kind of separate those clumps what is the most meaningful part of it is it the on-field drills that everybody sees watching it is yeah. it the uh meetings in the teams with the players is it the medical yeah because that? that's what the combine used to be it used to be just medical right yeah. back in the day that's the biggest thing okay so yeah. like for for example for scouts you come in for the draft meetings um in december yeah. and then we come back after the combine after the pro days and like you'll have guys position on the board and you'll come back and you're like dude where the heck is johnson like johnson was like all the way I up there this guy where man? is he <laughs> and they're like medical medical wow. got him you know so then they'll drop a guy down there's some other guys you kind of put in the holding tank on there we're like okay we gotta see how the medical shakes out right. oh he passed so so we're good so that has the most impact um but i'd say it's different with different positions like quarterbacks mm -hmm. the meetings obviously huge. huge your position the meetings are going to be huge yeah um and then corners you know how they run this is kind of a big pretty deal. big deal pretty big deal are there any drills for specific i guess positions that you are like this is a really important drill for that position there that you really hone in on when those guys are doing that well i i think probably from being around Jim Washburn during that time. The, yeah. I just, I mean, the hoop's always just seeing how guys can bend, you know, yeah. can you really corner? Um, I think that for pass rushers is, is something you can kind of hone in on. You learn a lot. It's it. If you're tight, it's going to get exposed in that. Sure. Yeah. If you don't have the ankle. Flexion, Howard had you hip. guys, had you guys doing that stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think that there's a carryover between O-line and if yeah. you can't bend yeah. and you can't, and you don't have the ankle flexion to get in a, a good position, um, you're going to struggle offensive line or defensive line. And yeah. the hoop drill is like, you know, for an ed any edge rusher that can get low and maintain the speed coming around that thing, mm -hmm. good luck. Like Miles Garrett doing that drill is one of the freakiest it's things I've ever seen, and, man. And <laughs> we practiced against him this year. Yeah. And he went up against Jordan Mulata, who is an unbelievable tackle. In the yeah. Game. And uh, it was so funny because the first day we were out there, uh, Miles wasn't there. I think he had some family thing going on. And Jordan – unbelievable practice and the next day and miles only did one-on-ones yeah and he hit, did exactly what you're saying he bent the hoop at the size and speed that he is and everyone right away was like whoa that is <laughs> way different and matter yeah. of fact joel petonio was i was standing yeah. right next to because i wasn't practicing i was in a jersey because i just had elbow surgery joel petonio was like can you believe we're like the same, like he's a human being. <laughs> like, he's, like, he's like a superhero. Yeah, no, it's not normal. Yeah, and um, 
And the funniest thing, we're watching tape after practice, and uh, Stout's like, Jordan, you're, you're, you're turning, and you're mad. He's like, yeah, well, look at him. He's going to against a different guy. Like, and so that's always one of my favorites. It's like, we're going to uh, – you're expected to maintain perfect technique. And Come on. <laughs> he's a super freak. Yeah. He's an absolute super freak. When he was yeah. coming out, I was talking to one of the coaches at AM just to get back. I mean, the tape was what it was. He was the best yeah. player by far. But I'm like, he seems like in talking to him, so mild-mannered. Like, does sure. he like does he have a button that you push? Like, does he ever get to that point? And he goes – he was playing basketball in high school mm-hmm. and uh, they had lost. I don't know if it was a state championship or a big game. And he's like, we come in and he goes right into the locker room and all of a sudden we just hear this noise. And he goes, he had grabbed the stalls by each side, went in there with one side and just pulled the entire stalls down, oh just snapped gosh. them, snapped them off the wall, both sides laying on the ground when they came in there. And he's like, yeah, he has a switch. Yeah, well, right. I pray to God nobody ever has to see yeah, that. <laughs> hopefully he's good at manipulating it and it doesn't just come out of nowhere. But yeah. yeah. That's all. That's unbelievable. There's a few guys that you watch, and you're just like, man, that guy is so different. Um, what about AD? What about Aaron Donald? So Aaron, luckily, I do not have to block him one on one that often. Like yeah. he's usually outside rushing a guard, but mm-hmm. same thing. The, the level of quickness. I always think for defensive linemen, the best defensive linemen out there are guys that have speed and power. Mm-hmm. If you only have speed, there's things you can do to kind of you know guard against that. Yeah. If, if you're if you're a finesse player. You can go with a little bit wider hands when you punch. You can do things that uh, you can bait him into certain like areas, right? Mm-hmm. To like push him where he needs to go. Yeah. Um, if you only have power, I'm going to sit down on that all day and sell out on that. Yeah. But if you have both, it's hard. It's really, really hard to maintain balance. Uh, and for me, especially being an undersized guy, I have to, I lean a little bit now to stop power. I have to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think. Uh, AD has all of it. Right? Yeah. He's got the unbelie- unbelievable twitch. Um, he's one of the few three techniques that can win consistently rushing outside of a guard. Like yeah. most really, really good three technique passers are either going through the guard or doing a quick move inside yeah. and get him early. Yeah. Him, Chris Jones, there's only a handful of guys that are like winning on like outside hand swipes on a, as a three technique yeah. and somehow sneaking through the B gap. Yeah. And you Trevor have, Price used to do that. Like yeah. when I was in Baltimore, Trevor Price was there, and it was it was freaky. If you can do that, it it opens up so much for you to do to the guard because then mm-hmm. the guard's like, man, I got to move out there now, and then that creates separation. That a gap gets a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. It's so I think AD, and then just being relentless. Yeah, like I, he's, is that the most? I, I want to ask you a scouting question because I feel like that's like the most underrated aspect of yeah. a pass rusher, in inside or outside. Any defensive player, if you yeah. play truly to the echo of the whistle, yeah, you're, and you run to the ball, you're gonna be around it. Yeah, and when you when you combine that with like unbelievable physical traits, it's it's a pretty good recipe. And um, AD is he's just relentless. He's like a bulldog down there that just is mad and angry. You're like, man, I'm just we're just playing football. Why are you mad at me? I'm just trying to <laughs> do my talk? job. Does he talk? Hey, Kel, stop coming over. Stop. What are you helping the guard for? I'm like, you think I'm gonna leave you one on one? You're the best player in the in the NFL. I'm going to slide to you every time. Like, uh, what are you? We're gonna not just gonna let you ruin the game, Aaron. Yeah, that's <laughs> so. So, that's so good. That's amazing. Well, so I want to ask you another scouting question. There, I'm hijacking this for selfish reasons. No, I love this. Please, because they're better when it's a dialogue. Because because, because to me, like we'll have a debate this year as well. You've got a premier edge guy and you've got a premier interior guy. In terms of from an offensive line standpoint, you're getting ready for the game. You know who you're up against. One week it's this guy. One week it's the guy out there. What, what's more difficult to navigate around? So um, I think a premier edge player forces the offense to structurally help it more. Like you're going to do formations that put guys in front of them. You're going to chip more with either a tight end, preferably, or running back. You're going to design plays that are going to mess with them a little bit more. Yeah, It's harder to do that at, at D-tackle. You can still do it, mm-hmm. but um, I feel like D-tackle, it's, um, it's just you can, the best thing you can do is slide to them. Yeah. There's not really a chip. I mean, some teams will try and chip like a running back through the B gap, but that's rare. Mm-hmm. So if you have a really monstrous D tackle, especially you, I mean, if you if you're building five man fronts, if you're blitzing mm-hmm. a lot, for me to slide to that guy every time, like we're giving up. Yeah, like that's very risky. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we can be hot over here all day. Yeah, and like if we don't have like either a hot answer away from them, or and if you move them around, mm-hmm. like if if you play not if, if you're an overfront all day, every day, mm-hmm. and you can guarantee he's going to be the t- to the tight end. You can do something structurally. Yeah. But if, especially on third down, you mix them up, you do the overload fronts, 
you blitz uh, every once in a while that I have to be honest with where I'm putting the protection. Mm -hmm. It's harder, in my opinion, and I probably shouldn't be saying this. But no, no, it's, it's great. It's harder to uh, structurally do something for a D tackle if you're doing all of that. So this is why I think, and I, I know you know we both know Howie really well, but I think that that personnel departments and coaching staffs that don't communicate well, and I would I would add players in there. Like I think there's more of a role. I'm not saying you bring in players and like they're going to pick who you're going to see who we're taking in the draft, but information like that when you're sitting there in the second round and you got equally graded edge rusher, equally graded defensive tackle, yeah. like that information knowledge from your players and from your coaches, I feel yeah. like there's a lot of organizations that don't communicate that stuff. But, but I will say I don't. There's there's only at a given time maybe like two or three, maybe four D tackles that are like that level of disruption. Yeah. There's more guys at DN because most of the best athletes on the oh, defensive yeah. side are playing DN. Yeah. So in a given year, there's more guys probably at that defensive end of the position that are going to have that impact. Mm -hmm. Like I, I give you AD this year, Dexter Lawrence, certainly. Yeah. Um, Quinn, Chris Jones. Quinn, Quinn's getting there. Yeah. 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 Quinn and Williams. Uh, I, I think all of those guys, like those are like the guys I can think of right off the top. Yeah. And that have been like, Run stopping, like pass rushing, like these guys, we have to make sure we know where they're at at all times mm -hmm. and we're affecting everything because of that. Mm -hmm. Other guys that are really, really good, it's like, okay, we're going to do some things, but we're not going to let it yeah. consume us. Um, whereas defensive end, I think every week you're kind of like, I mean, it's gotten to the point where every team has pretty much good edge rushers. At mm -hmm. this. Like They're all investing in that. Um, there's great players coming out every year. Like it's it's to the point now that you can't even have a bad like it used to be like you had to have a lockdown left tackle. I know. Right tackle could yeah. just be like a, yeah. a big run blocking right tackle. And like now it's just not the case. Like you have to have two premier yeah. tackles at blocking the edge. We used to always say in drafting this guy's gotta play on the right side. Yeah. You can't say that anymore. You can, look who's uh, rushing. Look who's rushing over there. It's, and yeah. that's why, like, you know, I'm so happy for like Lane Johnson that he started oh, yeah. to get uh the credit that he's deserved for a long time. Uh you know, it's for years, all the credit went to the left side guys, and they mm -hmm. were the ones that made the Pro Bowl, and it's still pretty much dominated left side. But, um, you know, Mitchell Schwartz, I mean, there's there's some right tackles that have been really, really good that didn't get the accolades probably they deserve because they were right side guys, even yeah. though they were doing the same thing against unbelievable edge rushers. guys. Yeah. Is there anybody this week that you're really excited to watch? Like, I, I don't know anything. Yeah. Really. No, no. Yeah, no, there is, there is, man. And the, this this week we're going to have a lot of the quarterbacks are throwing. So Bryce Young's the best one, in my opinion, at Alabama. He's undersized. But he's not going to work out here. He's going to wait till his pro day. Okay. But all the other guys are throwing. Yeah. So, and, and people That's say, rare. Yeah, that, normally everybody waits to the pro day. Yeah. So to see him and look – Everybody gets kind of carried away with this ball sale or this. I don't care about that. Like, they don't know these receivers. There's no timing. You're not looking at that. I just want to see how they move around a little bit, their footwork. And then you can just see how the ball comes out of their hand. Yeah. And, you know, in scouting, we always say you need to go see quarterbacks throw live because mm -hmm. you can watch them on tape, but you don't know. And I'm sure you've seen it even, you know, guys, you, you look across the field. And if you haven't seen Josh Allen throw a football live, like it's different, man. <laughs> yeah, However yeah. good, whatever it looks like on tape, it's different when you see that in person. Right. Um, and it works the other way sometimes too. So just getting to see the ball come out of their hand a little bit that's always fun there's there's a kid anthony richardson from florida that's he's gonna be 6'4 235 i don't know if he's gonna run but he's like a legit 4'4 guy like he's crazy yeah he's got 80 yard runs 60 yard runs in the sec as a quarterback wow. and then he's got he's just got a huge arm so i'm kind of looking forward to seeing him yeah, it's funny you say you have to like be there to see some of these guys throw because i will i watch michael vick play my entire childhood mm -hmm. and then the first time i ever did a practice with him and watched him throw a ball and like the whip oh yeah and like at like the end like the last like little spin he put on it <laughs> like, dude this is insane like yeah. how fast and like it's like being shot out of something you know what i mean it's oh, not yeah. just like somebody just throwing a ball it's different and it's hard to exp i don't even know how to explain it i guess but. so i remember being there for those practices and I, you remember the the long touchdown to deshaun against washington right so i want to get your side of that story because i'll give you mine it's slightly different yeah. so i'm scouting for the eagles i'm on the west coast i just got back from like a road trip so i'm home me and my brother-in-law go to uh, the nicest, fanciest restaurant you've ever seen, P.F. Chang's. Yeah, That's a simple plug. Uh, so we're, we're we're in there and we're in the bar area. We're watching the game, and it's like we've just settled in. And I'm like, okay, you know, watching the game. And normally it's your, it's you know, I work for the team, but you don't, you know, no cheering in the press box. You kind of take that mentality, right? Okay. He uncorks that one first play of the game. Yeah. And I lost my mind. And, and everybody in the P.F. Chang's is looking around like, dude, this is like the biggest Eagles fan of all time. They had no idea that I work with these guys. Yeah, but yeah. that was one of the, that's still one of the best football throws I've ever seen. Yeah. It, it, it was combining 
probably the two best players at that. Like very few quarterbacks could throw a deep ball like Mike could. Yeah. And I don't think to this day, I mean, I didn't play with Randy Moss and some of these yeah. other guys, but yeah. Desh- watching Deshaun Jackson track a ball, it was unbelievable. It, yeah. it, it's it was like an out center field. He played baseball. It makes sense when you mm-hmm. really think about it. He tracked it like Willie Mays or like some one of these all time great <laughs> outfielders would track a ball. Yeah, and he would kick it into like another gear. Mm-hmm. Like he would be running step for step with the DB. Mike would throw it up, and he would just like a oh man gone. Yeah, and yeah, that play was like a uh, like a like okay. We got something here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I scared a lot of people in that restaurant that night. I can promise you that. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> so you talked about the combine kind of separates guys that are close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many guys is it actually like changing out of this week? Like is most of this – I guess I'll ask this question first. Yeah. When does like a draft board start to be assembled? When is it like actually tiered like that? Is yeah. that already happened and then the combine – it's kind of happening after that started. Yeah, so the, the first board will go up in December. And that's like, you know, there's books about this, right? You, just, you want to anchor it. You want it so that you don't have these wild swings. So once you put them up on the board and you've kind of got them in your ranges, it makes it more difficult than to have the wild swings. Like got a lot it. of people call the spring like the fog of confusion. Like, you know, this is, we're not yeah. playing football anymore. So let's not get too carried away from what we thought of these guys coming off the Watching football the season, coming off the tape. So you get the board up there. But what happens a lot of times, if you look at your board, so say you've got your positions across this way, mm-hmm. then you've got the grades going down this way. So okay. you, you have your, that's the image of the board. Well, we might have, say it's a center, right? So we have center. Instead of stacking them on top of each other, we might have two or three of them that we put next to each other and say, okay, we have the same grade. We're not going to say this guy's better than that guy. We're yeah. going to say these guys are all together. They're traveling together. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to go to the all-star game. We're going to go to the combine and we're going to interview them and bring them into the facility if we, we still haven't figured it out and, sure. and pro day, everything else. And then it, it, you have more guys watch it. Coaches will come into the process a little bit later. Yeah. Um, and so they'll get to, get to watch them. And then you kind of, okay, now we can start separating those guys. How does evaluating like the level of a player while also factoring the position and value of that position factor mm-hmm. in, right? So like you might have an unbelievably dominant center. Mm-hmm. Like, we keep using center for some reason. I love that. I love that. <laughs> center. This is center talk. I love it. I'm here for it. But obviously – quarterback is a the most important position on the field. Mm. So how do you evaluate like this guy's a game changing level center or like the best yeah. center we've seen in the last five years yeah. versus like a top five every year quarterback? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're going to see it um, at a couple different positions this year because, you know, running back is the popular one. Yeah. Because people, you know, you find running backs anyway. We just saw Pacheco in the Super Bowl as a seventh round pick. Mm -hmm. But then I'm I'm telling you, like, there's some guys that are different. There's some guys that are special. If you think you have Adrian Peterson, you know, anybody wants to make fun of you taking Adrian Peterson in the first round, let him make fun of me. I'll play with Adrian. Some guys, yeah. There's some real dudes. Yeah. And like Texas, to me, their running back this year, B. John Robinson, he's my fourth highest graded player in the whole draft. Yeah. I saw you had him mocked. To potentially Philadelphia. I talked right? about I talked about Philly. And I said, I said, look, how he's never, never doing gonna this. Happen. Never gonna happen. Never ever gonna happen. I've been there. I know it. Yeah. Off the ball linebackers and running backs are not getting picked in the first round. They don't believe in Especially it. Especially high. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you guys have continued to invest in the trenches and it's paid off. But I do think there's exceptions every now and then, though. There's a difference and making player. Big of a he's a freak, speak. man. And the thing is, like on running backs, to go back to that, like don't don't waste their carries. So if we acknowledge and we all can acknowledge their their shelf life's not real long sure. position. So if you say you have four, five, maybe six years of, of really good play of a running back, don't you want all those carries to matter? If you've got a really good team, then, you know, it's not like you're saying I'm t- advocating taking the running back over a pass rusher or you know, a quarterback if you don't have one. But if you've got right. a lot of those pieces in place and you have a really good team and now you take a premier running back, like every one of his carries is going to matter. because yeah. You're a relevant team right now. Yeah. And when you do have that guy, he is a enormous difference maker like we've yeah. seen that either with uh pollard we've seen certainly when zeke was in his prime yeah. I mean, look at the jets this year like yeah. that's my argument for people talking about the running back position yeah. look at the jets with Brees hall and look at them without Brees hall exactly for some reason the running back went from being the like co- the position right under quarterback is like this guy could be like a game-changing yeah. guy to now it's like there's almost nobody picking them in the first round yeah anymore, right? and 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 there, look the other side of the coin is you're finding them you know day three running backs every year right that are really good that are, is this good a players deep, it's deep deep man. running back class yeah. so do you think that that could hurt maybe i think it's going to hurt him i think just the positional value and the fact that there's depth of the position it's one of those deals where if you talk to everybody in the league they'll all agree he's a great player and nobody can agree on when they think he's going to go like what enables i guess maybe like like LaShawn McCoy to play 10 plus years yeah. at a high level. Like watching Adrian Peterson, 
there's no way I would have thought he would have lasted 10 years. Yeah. Because he not only was he fast and violent, physical, violent, violent runner. Yeah. yeah. Like most of those guys are not lasting that long. Is that just kind of like a crapshoot in some ways? Like you're, you get lucky? Yeah. I would say Adrian Peterson's like in his own world. Like, I mean, I think probably when they look back on the game, 20 years from now, he's going to be one of those guys where, you know, and these are big names. Are you talking about like Bo Jackson? Like, like those guys just look, they're different. Yeah. They're not, nobody's the next Adrian Peterson. Right. Okay. That is one of one. Yeah. Um, so he was his own thing. But like Shady was, he, he was more quickness based. And he, he didn't take a lot, a lot of punishment. Yep. And then he wasn't just a pure speed back because these guys are all going to lose a step as they get older. Mm -hmm. That was never, he, he was like a four five, mid four five guy coming his, out. His strength was elusiveness. Yeah. Like, just like, like he, his in space, like with he the was, ball out here. I know. He used to drive coaches crazy. <laughs> I know. But if you look back at the he stats, he didn't, I know. Yeah. I, it's the most mind blowing thing. Like breaks everything any football has ever taught you about ball security. Yeah. But from hey. five points of pressure to two points of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that led to some of that elusiveness, though. Yeah. Like, I mean, when you're all on, he, I mean, he was playing basketball. Yeah. He was literally out there crossing guys over. Yeah. In on a football field. Yeah. One hundred percent. But I mean, it is interesting when you think about the. You know the value of the positions yeah so this year like 10 of my top 50 players are edge rushers you know to what you were saying earlier there's yeah. a lot more edge rushers than there are interior defensive linemen yeah so this is interesting because you say well there's a lot of them maybe i can wait but it's such a premium position that they're gonna they go all quick. go man they're gonna be a huge run i feel like it's easier to see guys that are put in one-on-one -on -one positions and are pretty scheme independent on whether they succeed. So I'll give you like like a defensive end. If a defensive end is consistently beating an offensive tackle, yeah. he's got great measurables. Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy to be like, that guy's probably- That translates. Yeah. yeah. Quarterback, you know, is the offensive line good? Are the, does he have good receivers? Like, is the coach putting him in good positions? Like, I feel like with every level of variable that's added, is, is it harder to evaluate that player on whether he's good or bad? It's Does the, that make sense? It's the quarterback's the hardest thing to get right, I sure. think, in scouting. And, and I have buddies in all different sports yeah. evaluating quarterback because two things. It's it's a dependent position, as you mentioned. You're yeah. dependent on all these other things. Yeah. So what happens is you can overgrade a guy sure. because he's got an unbelievable offensive line. He's thrown to three <laughs> NFL wideouts, right? <laughs> exactly. So now I've graded him too high. Yeah. And then you've got a Josh Allen who's at Wyoming who's got mm -hmm. a couple bankers and farmers in front of him, you know, <laughs> throw, throwing – <laughs> throwing to guys that aren't ever going to play, you know, beyond college. Sure. Yeah. And he's playing against Oregon and Iowa. And so mm -hmm. maybe, you know, we don't give him credit for doing what he's doing with who he's playing with. That's mm -hmm. why it's so. And then the other thing is, so that's college. Yeah. And now it matters. Where do you go in the NFL? NFL yeah. The guys that are perceived bus, they go someplace else. They could have been. 100%. Right? 100%. Purple. You're like, dude, if this guy would have landed in Philadelphia or San Francisco or Kansas City, like, I think this guy would have been a real player. I think about that all the time with offensive linemen because I'm like, man, there's no way some of these guys aren't good players. Like, mm -hmm. you see him and you're like, if I feel like if Jeff Stoutland, yeah. and I, I know I'm biased because I've been with Stout for a long time, but like, situation, coaching, system, whether you're the right fit for it, mm -hmm. um, players around you, like, all of that goes into being a good player and having a successful career. Now, if you're, if you're, there are scheme independent guys, and those are harder to find later in the draft. Yeah. Right? Like Fletcher Cox, no matter where he went, was going to be pretty darn good. I don't even know how you begin to evaluate a guy who is so dependent on other guys. It's, impo him. it's impossible, yeah. man. It's flipping a coin. But yeah. like on the, you know, on the offensive line side of it, when I was in Baltimore. The worst thing, like, so you're all, you're all sitting in the room. We've all got our grades. We've all gone on the record. It's all been printed out in the book. The owner's in there. You can see the grades and stuff. And so a lot of times, you know, a guy gets picked, say a guy you thought stunk and he's a, you have a free agent grade. He gets picked in the third round. You're like, I don't care. That guy stinks. Like, yeah. he, he can't play. Sure. But if you if we had an offensive lineman that, that you had a free agent grade on and he went to the Colts, mm -hmm. We'd all be like, "Oh crap, Howard Mudd! This guy's gonna start for eight years!" <laughs> like, uh, like what? Are the, oh, it's not, you could see, literally see the scout in the room just go like, "Oh man!" Yeah, so, <laughs> like Kyle Devan. Kyle Devan. Kyle like Devan. Kyle Devan's gonna. He's a, oh, he's a he's a free agent. He Jeff Saturday. Like, yeah, Jeff. <laughs> like these guys all play forever. I was talking to Howie about this. So, he, like he said, Howard kind of changed the way he viewed offense. Like Howard was kind of in some ways ahead of the. Like he just wanted athletes. Yeah, and in Indy. They had really good lines. Obviously, in Philadelphia, we had great lines. And yeah. It changed the way, I guess, how he said that he evaluated offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. like, 
There yeah. was no difference. He was Howard was the first one I talked to who said like we were in meetings or something and somebody made the, the comment of like he's a right tackle only. And yeah. he was like, that's not how the league works anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> he saw the first hand in, no. uh, in Indianapolis yeah. with uh, Mathis and uh, Yeah, there's two of them. There's uh, two yeah, of them you got to yeah. deal with. Yeah. Daniel, obviously you were a scout with the Eagles when I first got to Philadelphia. You said you have the scouting report. I do. Okay. And um, keep in mind, it's a terrible miss. But um, – <laughs> But here's the story. So, Howie, one of the things Howie would do, mm -hmm. and I'm sure he still does it, and we still talk about players to this day, maybe a couple weeks before the draft, and he said, hey, I want you to look at these four interior offensive linemen. And under the under the impression these are day like later pick day three offensive linemen. So, it's four guys. Yeah. So, the, the first three guys are terrible. Okay. okay? And I, and you and you're really good. Obviously, you were 280 pounds. I'm sure you've told the story. You know, yeah. being sick, going there. So, but I'm lit out in California. I don't know who you are. I just know I'm watching a 280 pound center. <laughs> but I'm like, he's infinitely better than these other guys. <laughs> so I'll give you, I'll give you the end of my report here. It all says, uh, all right, overall, there are other centers in this draft class that are ahead of him right now, but he has a higher ceiling than all of them. And the right scheme, he'll start for us in two to three years. Holy cow. So, but I gave you, but here's the thing. So Honestly, I gave you. that's the best I think anybody gave me. No, but I, 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 gave, I gave you, I gave Everyone you. Everyone else was just like, I wasn't even on their board because I was too small. So, But it's a fifth round grade. And I thought like, I'm really putting myself out there. Like, we'll take this guy in the fifth round. He's a first ballot future <laughs> Hall of Famer. Like he's not a fifth round pick. Hey, uh, well, you were you were giving me more credit than anybody else was at the time, so I appreciate. No, that. you stuck out. You stood out like a sore thumb. I was I was ready for for Travis too. I didn't have his report. Yeah, but it was my first year in the media, and I had him behind uh, Eifert and Ertz. Then he was number, number three. three. Yeah, so I yeah, missed that. Oh, for two. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> those are, they ended up having good careers too. Well, yeah. especially Zach. Yeah. What made you go to the media? Yeah. Like, why did you stop? Scouting, I guess. So true story. I so I with Baltimore for four years, and then Cleveland gives me a promotion to go be their national scout. So I go to Cleveland. First year we go ten and six. The next year we go four and twelve. We all get fired, like part of the business. So I have eighteen months left on my contract. Um, I have an offset in my contract. So mm -hmm. wherever I go, I'm going to work for free for the next year. Sure. Yeah. So I got offered a job with the Cardinals, and I'm like trying to explain to my wife how this works. Like so, I can stay home. And we make this amount the of money, same. Yeah. or I can go be gone on the road for 150 days, and then it's a we, tough sell. And we, it's a tough sell. Yeah. And, and as I'm like talking, like this makes no sense. I'm like, so let's take this year off. Sure. Let's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna start a Twitter page and like see what happens because it was like I had been curious in the media and stuff. So I start that. It blows up. It takes off because this is early Twitter. Like no, there's no scouts on there, and like fantasy football people are asking you questions. So this this blows up. I get a broadcasting agent. I start doing stuff with ESPN. Um, and I think, okay, I'm going to go into, into media. And then the lockout happens. And people don't think about what, not just with the players, like that impacts networks. Like there's a hiring freeze. You're not hiring anybody if you don't know there's going to be any games. Right. So now my, my Randy Lerner sweet, sweet Browns contract's getting ready to run out. <laughs> uh, scholarship's about to come due. Mm -hmm. um, so then I was like, oh, crap. And uh, this, the media thing, I haven't got a full time job yet. I'm just kind of dabbling with this stuff. So then I went and talked to a couple teams with the Patriots and the Eagles and ended up taking the job with the Eagles. So I'm in Philly and, and halfway through my second year, the broadcasting agent, who I have not talked to in 18 months, I think that ship sailed. Yeah. He's like, hey, uh, ESPN and NFL Network want to hire you if you're interested in getting out of scouting and coming into broadcasting. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. And then, uh, so I ended up meeting with them kind of on the slide. Never told Howie that, like during, <laughs> during, during the year. And then uh, I got offered a job by NFL, by both of them. But NFL Network wanted me to start right away. And I'm like, I got to get through the draft. I can't leave before the draft. Right. So we do the draft, the the, the Fletcher uh, draft, so I think 12. Coach, yeah. yeah. 12. And then uh, literally that night after the draft, I went into Howie's office and was like, hey, man, I've, I've got this opportunity. Can I just, I just want to give you a couple days. I'm going to try and figure things out. And then talked to my wife and we're like, this is going to be better for us just as a family. I'm, my kids are getting older. I don't want to miss their games. Um, and the network was, you know, close to my house. I didn't have to move to Connecticut. So yeah. I ended up making that move. That's crazy. What, um, what does nobody know about scouting? Like what is, what was, was it the traveling? Was that the hardest part? Oh, man, it's brutal. Yeah. It's so brutal. Like that, that's a thing. And I see like guys that I started with. So I, my first year was in 03. Mm -hmm. So I've been coming to over 20 of these combines and you see guys that, and like, dude, these guys are still on the We're road. Like, I don't know how they do it, man. Like I, I just couldn't do it. It's, it's rigorous. But, um, you know, I often get asked like, what's the number one thing you've learned from scouting? And I have a very serious answer to that. And that is if you're ever on a road trip, 
and you have to go to the bathroom. If you go to Starbucks, you're 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 a moron. Okay, <laughs> nobody does that. You don't you don't want a, a gas station. You're not that's subhuman. Like you can't do that. Yeah, you need to find what is a, the best. You find the hotel. Right. And yeah. the lobby hotel bathroom is the most pristine bathroom on the, on the face of the See, earth. That's you that's go in there. Right you there. go in there. The lady at the front desk. Hey, Mary, she doesn't remember that this guy check in earlier. I don't know. You yeah. go back, you use a facility. You might even get a cookie on the way out the oh door. My gosh. Yeah, it's, it's, I am yeah. for sure stealing this advice. As is everybody watching this from now on. Because I've been in a gas station bathroom. And you're 100% oh, it's, right. No, it's, you don't uh, want to do that. And Starbucks. Yeah, I think their coffee shop bathrooms are probably <laughs> quite heavily used. <laughs> So, um, we appreciate you coming in and talking no, to man. us. No, man, congratulations to you, man. I, to, to look at not only what you and your brother have done as players, which has been incredible, but for you guys to be doing this, it's it's awesome, man. Thank you. So we're, happy for you. We're having a blast. We're uh, going to keep doing it for as long as people keep listening. <laughs> Welcome to the New Heights post-interview interview brought to you by Accelerator Active Energy Drink. Jason, what do you think of uh, Daniel Jeremiah's combine analysis? I mean, we're sitting here talking about the combine. Not the draft, the combine. Not the actual draft, the combine. Not the draft, we're talking about the combine. I mean, how silly is that? We're talking about 40s, vertical jumps. Not the draft, broad jumps. I mean, what? (laughs) You watch the draft and you'll see everything he's got. You know what I want to talk about, though? Accelerator active energy drinks. A lot of wonderful flavors, you know, beautiful cans. This one right here is berry lemonade. They're fitting as many fruits as they can in these suckers. With a lot of plant-based thermogenics and natural caffeine, it'll get you going for the combine or the draft. The actual draft. Accelerator Energy Drinks. It gives you energy. You can find Accelerator at Target, Albertson, Safeway, Quick Trip, and Hy-Vee. So... That's our uh, Daniel Jeremiah interview. DJ. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining the show, DJ. Uh, it was awesome to have you on and to reminisce. Gave me my scouting report. How about that? What would you think? I thought it was awesome. I think he was spot on with you. Got a lot of questions for you, DJ, on how you thought I was the third best tight end on the board. Uh, we had a few. We had It was a good tight end class. It was a good tight end class. It was a great tight end class. So I can't be mad at that. There was even a few tight ends that got taken after me that had a pretty good career. Um, Who got taken after you? Jordan Reed. Jordan Jay Reed, Reed out of Florida. Yeah, he was a dog. Dude, he you was want to talk beast. about run some routes? That He's boy can route some shit up. I mean, let's be honest. Daniel Jeremiah wasn't the only person that had Tyler Eifert and uh, Zach Ertz right above you. You're right. And I, I have to live with that for the rest of my life. You don't have to live with it. It worked out great. You end up getting drafted to Kansas City, <laughs> playing with Andy Reid. Why now, would you want me? I wasn't even the first center drafted to the Philadelphia Eagles that year. Shut the fuck up. I swear to God. Julian Vanderbilt, he was a guard center that was taken in the fifth round. I was drafted in the sixth round. Well, can't keep a Kelsey boy down. I'll tell you what. Um, I would love to know what he thought Tyler and Zach did better than me. Well, they probably interviewed better based on what you said your interviews <laughs> did. Like. <laughs> Daniel wasn't in those interviews. Now we're just playing telephone. See, I yeah. knew it. These these guys on TV are just going by word of mouth. I mean, Zach I knew went it. to Stanford and, and Tyler went to Notre Dame. Those are probably two good interviews. Automatic, yeah, automatically. They just, yeah, well, they went to class, so they know how to at least conduct themselves in a fucking room. Um, oh, God. Uh, me over here, just like, ah, well, it's, it's a little too quiet in here. You guys want to hear a joke? Zach Hurts panned out. Let's, let's Z- just be honest. Zach, Zach panned out. 1,000%. And Tyler Eifert was a pro bowler. He just got banged up and had to deal with some, some, I believe, some ankle injuries that this has never got better for him. And you know what I mean? That's There's a lot of fortune that comes into being a, 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 not even just a successful tight end, but a, you know what I mean? Like a guy that can get to 10 years. Like there's this game is. We've both been really lucky. It's a game that puts a lot of strain, a lot of stress on, on your body, man. But that, that's. By all means, not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to take shots at either Ertz, Eifert, or any of the other tight ends, Vance McDonald, Gavin Escobar, any of the guys that went uh, before me or after me. You know what I mean? I'm just saying in my mind, do you, what do you made think, them better than me? That's all. That's all. I just want to know. I'm curious, DJ. Do you think you were the number one tight end on Kansas City's board that year? Oh, my gosh. I want to know now. 
We got to ask somebody. To, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna have to ask John Dorsey. I think we got to go to the head. Ooh, John would be a good one. John I Dorsey. Think, but I think Veach was go a to, scout. Veach was was a scout. He, oh yeah, Veach was a scout in Philly, and then he went with Andy to Casey. We got to ask the head man himself. Big Red. I mean, I'd love to get him on the show. Hey, Coach. It's Travis. You want to come on our show? What'd you say? Do you want nothing? You want to? <laughs> you want to go get a burger? <laughs> Hey, Remember? Coach, you know how, we, uh, just, uh, how I just won you that Super Bowl? Can you come on podcast? <laughs> just say it real fast. Just say it real fast. It's one of those, like, like when you were calling Gronk, man, I hope this goes to voicemail. I hope it goes to voicemail. DJ, thank you very much for, for sitting down with my big brother, talking a little combine and uh, the scouting world then and yep. all the madness in Indy that weekend. Um, we appreciate yep. you big time. And uh, thank you for putting a, putting me in my place and telling me I'm not shit. I appreciate that. It helps me. kind of fuels the fire even more today, 10 years later. <laughs> it's it's good to know that uh, sometimes you – I don't know. You suck. You just suck. You're I don't not think as good it's like everyone that. Else. I, I like that. I, I like the feeling of sucking. I think there's a lot that sucking. goes into being a high draft pick, and there's a lot of guys that end up being great players that aren't dra- high draft picks and – um, it's just the part of the imperfect nature that is the NFL draft. Um, and it certainly panned out for both of us. And uh, DJ, uh, you're the man, brother. It was great you're talking the man. To you. That wraps up the Combine Edition of New Heights. Uh, make sure you're subscribed on YouTube uh, to the New Heights channel so you know when new episodes and content is being dropped. Uh, listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, make sure you check out the official merch, including the new merch, over at homage.com slash new heights. You heard the man. Head over to homage.com. Get you a stamp of the week shirt or a no dumb questions shirt or any of the fun tees that we got on there. Uh, it's always it's always cool, man. Homage is uh, Ohio based and I've been wearing those shirts for years, man. Once again, New Heights is a Jukes original show presented by Wave Sports and Entertainment and brought to you by our friends at Fireball, baby. That's Cinnamon Delight. I need some right now. Follow the show on all social media platforms at New Heights Show with one S for fun clips throughout the week. And um, thanks to our production and crew. We're uh, we're living a wild and wacky offseason already, and uh, you guys have been awesome. Finding ways to keep this train running, baby. Um, yeah. And shout out to all the 92 percenters, baby. Hey, hey. Yeah, yeah. Ho, 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 ho. We love you guys. Appreciate you guys tuning in to the Combine episode. See you guys soon. Peace. Peace.